If there's one thing that's become obvious since becoming your favorite anti-tuber, it's this. You will never watch it all. I had to learn the hard way that as much as I love the idea of someday willing myself to start shows like Moriarty the Patriot or My Wife is the Student Council President, I'm more likely to rewatch Toradora or Clan Ad before starting either of those. It's in that sentiment that I decided to start this seasonal review series. After all, with a brand new slate of anime being aired on a continuous cycle every three months like clockwork, there's no way anyone could possibly watch it all, right? I'm Pixelation, and welcome to another episode of Anime I Adored and Those That Bored, where we're going to recap the most recent anime season and tell you which titles deserve a watch and which should be avoided at any cost. Let's start with the anime I dropped like a sack of bricks. Titles so needlessly bad I could find no good reason to keep watching, let alone put it on my pause list. experiencing a severe case of deja vu. In the last episode of the series in winter 2022, the first title I dropped was Doll's Frontline by Asahi Production, and the first title I dropped this time around is Gushing Over Magical Girls, also by Asahi Production. It could simply be that the studio and I don't mesh well, as they have never made an anime I thought was particularly notable in any way, shape, or form. I went into gushing over Magical Girls with an open mind. I expected a cute, if not bland, Maho Shoujo series that, at worst, at absolute worst, would simply keep my on-hold list warm in a cold, cold winter. What I got was a cursed piece of degen trash that'd make the worst sinner living on the final layer of Gehenna blush before finally, at long last, releasing the torrent of sexual tension trapped in their loins. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're curious, the series follows a young girl who adores her town's team of magical girls to the point of obsession. That is, until one day when she's blackmailed into joining the team of ne'er-do-wells the magical girls regularly do battle with. In time, and by in time I mean within the span of a single episode, she unlocks her non-consensual BDSM fetish by capturing and torturing the magical girls to the point of ruin and beyond. Imagine if Love After World Domination and Redo of Healer had a bastard child in Clockwork Orange with the most deranged hentai imaginable. That's what this is. I feel weird dropping a series by Pine Jam. I don't mean to imply that everything they touch turns to gold, but after Gamers and Gleipnir, I want to give this relatively new studio the benefit of the doubt. But in the case of Tis Time for Torture, Princess, there wasn't enough here to justify a full series, in my opinion. In a lot of cases, studios create an anime with such a limited foundation that it doesn't make sense how they'll sustain it for a full core of 12 episodes. I would say that this is one such series, as the premise can, unfortunately, be boiled down to one extremely stretchy and flexible joke. In the series, the titular princess is captured by her kingdom's enemy, and they taunt her with aromas and foods under the guise of torture until her spirit is broken and she reveals critical info about their plans and strategies. It reminds me of Miss Koizumi Loves Ramen Noodles, another series I dropped during its season due to the joke being stretched too thin across an entire season. It could have been an OVA or an anime short. If you're new here, we cover on hold or paused anime a little differently than dropped or completed shows. In an effort to cut down on this video's total runtime, let's summarize my thoughts on the shows that I couldn't complete for one reason or another in a series of haikus. I am not a professional poet, and I most certainly know it. Ready? Begin. Villainous titles are getting out of control. This was the weakest. Fluffy Paradise. It was wholesome and healing. Maybe sometime else. Speaking of healing, the weakest tamer was on that very same list. To be honest, I was kind of put to sleep by Villain San's day off. The Adventurer, much like his show, was undead. But maybe later. 
Tales of Wedding Rings. Seemed like your average isekai. With a harem twist. If a silent voice was about the deaf woman, that would be this show. Buchi Giri is what you get if Aladdin and JoJo's had kids. Before watching Solo Leveling, the only thing I knew about it was that the light novel's publisher had the absolute cojones to make the cover as bland as possible. I also went out of my way to avoid reading anything about the plot until I was able to check out the anime, so when the first episode dropped, I knew we had something special on our hands with this one. Solo Leveling's title implies that it belongs to the tried and true MMORPG genre, but would you believe me if I said it doesn't? In fact, you could argue the series has more to do with augmented reality than virtual reality, but even then, that's not entirely accurate. It follows Sung jin who, in a world like our own but plagued by portals leading to interdimensional dungeons filled with monsters, has been called the weakest hunter of all time. But one day, whilst on what should have been a routine raid, most of his raiding party is wiped out and he is given a terrifying ultimatum. Die or become a player. Now, he's the only person in existence who can progressively improve their stats and get stronger. But this blessing could easily become a curse when viewed in the right light, and Jinu is about to learn how terrifying his world really is. I both love and am infuriated by solo leveling. I adore it for its intense and captivating action, writing, and voice acting but I am infuriated by how they manage to end each and every episode in a way that leaves you breathless for more. I realize that might sound like a cop-out, but I don't care. Seeing Jinu's descent into madness and seeing what lengths he'll go to to protect his family and himself reminds me of how it felt watching Walt in the early seasons of Breaking Bad, or Eren in the early seasons of Attack on Titan. I can only hope that they don't wholly assassinate Jinu's character in the final seasons like Isayama did with Eren McGenocide Jaeger. Here's hoping! In the seasonal anime game, you learn rather quickly that not every series is created equally, especially when it comes to rom-coms. I don't mean to suggest that all of the new rom-com offerings are terabad, but it takes something special for a rom-com anime to ascend to the hallowed halls of greatness. In recent years, we've seen a handful of titles beat the odds. Kageki Asima Love is War, The Quintessential Quintuplets, and My Dress Up Darling are some examples. But now, we have one more to add to the annals of history. Hokkaido Gals are super adorable, which is another collaboration between the studios behind 2022's The Maid I Hired Recently is Mysterious and The Greatest Demon Lord is Reborn as a Typical Nobody. And unlike both of those titles, this one is actually perfect and accomplishes exactly what it set out to do, and then some. Hokkaido Gals Are Super Adorable is, at first glance, your average fringe harem title akin to My First Girlfriend is a Gal or Girlfriend Girlfriend in the sense that the MC isn't the brightest crayon in the box, yet he somehow attracts more and more women the more he exhibits his density. But within a few apps, it establishes itself as a wholesome rom-com that hits all of the important notes with flawless accuracy. It follows Tsubasa Shiki, who's moving to the snowy region of Hokkaido, where he encounters Minami Fuyuki, Sayori Yakino, and Rena Natsukawa, each of whom become his close friends and add to his new life in their own unique ways. I would go so far as to suggest that everyone in this series is a cinnamon roll who can do no wrong, but that would be revealing a bit too much. I would love to see a second season for these characters, but in the meantime, go give this one a watch and thank me later. Do you ever feel like an anime has too many cooks? To elaborate, the anime feels like too many people were trying to convey too many ideas into the plot, and as a result, it feels chaotic and disjointed. This is how I felt about Sasaki and Peeps, the second offering this season by Silverlink. But while I do feel like the story suffers because its writers felt the need to cram way too many plot points into its first core, it's still worth watching despite that. 
In fact, this series might have had the strongest opener of the season, and that may or may not be entirely because it was a double-length episode. Sasaki and Peeps follows who else but Sasaki, a middle-aged office worker who becomes the owner of a Java Sparrow named Peeps, who is actually a reincarnated mage from another world. Peeps begins to teach Sasaki the ins and outs of magic, which leads to his involvement in a secret government agency full of espers, a looming magical girl threat, and a series of extra-dimensional worlds he can travel to, one of which he establishes himself as a successful merchant in. I said this one was a lot, didn't I? But again, I still think Sasaki and Peeps is worth checking out, if for no other reason than the dynamic between our titular heroes. Sasaki is honestly such a mood, and he's definitely relatable. I like to think that I, too, would proceed to become an interdimensional merchant if my bird one day decided to start venting about being a mage from another world. It seems like the right thing to do, to be completely honest. So, it should be said that the genre of anime with MMORPGs as a setting isn't my favorite. It's funny, because for every dot .hack or Overlord, there are about a million shows that uh, aren't either of those. But now I think we've stumbled across a new behemoth-class MMORPG anime, Shangri-La Frontier. Shangri-La Frontier follows Rakuro Hizutome, who might be the most accurate depiction of a gamer I have ever seen in anime. He's attained a small semblance of infamy playing and mastering what he calls trash games, and the inciting incident of the entire series is Rakuro deciding to try out a god-tier game, the titular Shangri-La Frontier. To be frank, Shangri-La Frontier does something I don't believe I have seen often in this genre. In many cases, including Sword Art Online, Dot Hack Sign, Log Horizon, etc., there's an existential reason the characters continue playing the game, whether it be because they could lose consciousness, they could die, or otherwise. In Shangri-La Frontier, there is no existential threat. Rakuro keeps playing because he wants to test his abilities, because he wants to prove to himself that he can overcome any obstacle, and most importantly, because he wants to keep playing a bomb-ass game, and I find that to be very cool. In fact, that's one thing I can definitely say about Shangri-La Frontier. It oozes cool, from its characters, to its intimidating and bone-chilling special bosses, to the fights that had put the most challenging souls born to shame. I am so excited for the second season. When it was announced, I just about lost my shit, because when it comes to these types of shows, I am normally unimpressed. But this one? It's brilliant. In my opinion, the villainous genre has gotten a bit too rambunctious the last few years. My next life as a villainous, I'm the villainous so I'm taming the final boss, the most heretical last boss queen from villainous to savior, game world reincarnation, I'm in love with the villainous, the list goes on and on. In the next title belonging to this genre, we have Seventh Time Loop. The villainous enjoys a carefree life married to her worst enemy, which takes the return by death mechanic from ReZero and applies it to an Otome setting. In the series, the Duke's daughter, Rishe, finds that as soon as she turns 20, she dies, or is killed in some way, and is thrown back to five years earlier. So, she proceeds to do what anyone would do in this situation, and tries to use her newfound immortality to learn what's going on. In Risha's various lives, she's become a merchant, a maid, a knight, and a doctor, but each time without fail, she dies or is killed in some way when she turns 20, and is forced to do it all over again. But in her seventh life, she runs into the crown prince of Galkine, Arnold Hine, who ends up proposing to Risha. In another life, she was mercilessly slain at Arnold's own hand, so this comes as a shock to Risha, but she goes along with it, if for no other reason than to make moves to prevent a war that's on the horizon. I had a really good time with this one, because it amalgamated the anxiety of Risha's next move with the classic Otome roots the genre is most known for. It feels like a masterclass in writing a suspense tale with a romantic drama backdrop to the point where you'll be rooting for Risha to succeed in manipulating her supposedly evil fiancé, while also rooting for their relationship to succeed against all odds, and I find that to be a really interesting dynamic. Speaking of standing self-reliant queens... In the brief time between the start of the year and the premiere of Dr. Elise, I remember mocking it for being the natural evolution of the isekai genre. 
It only made sense that isekais would proceed from a character being killed and reborn once to a character being killed and reborn twice. I suppose it's not too different from Seventh Time Loop, but at the time, I couldn't help but see it as a sign of the genre's death. But what I didn't realize was that Dr. Elise, the royal lady with the lamp, would go so hard it'd easily become one of my seasonal faves despite its silly premise. Dr. Elise centers on Elise de Clorance, who in her first life was a tyrannical empress who met her end on a burning stake. She's reincarnated into our world and, in order to atone for her past crimes, becomes a master surgeon. But it'd appear fate had other plans for her as she's involved in a plane crash and is reincarnated back into her past life as Elise. To continue her quest for atonement and to prevent the horrible future from becoming reality once again, she chooses to walk away from her arranged marriage and pursue medicine in this world as well. So the story is very much one of redemption, forgiving oneself from past wrongs, and learning that personal development can be achieved in the most unlikely of places. I found myself on the edge of my seat as the season inched closer to its inevitable end, and now that it's over, I... I can't believe I need a second season of an Isekai series! I never thought it possible, but look at what Dr. Elise has done to me! Maho Film, I'ma need you to not go out for cigarettes and never come back. I'm still waiting for Silverlink to give me a second season of A Sister's All You Need. My heart simply can't take being shattered all over again! I guess I need to learn to read or something. Alright, good thanks for watching this episode of Anime I Adored. It was a lot of fun making it. It's honestly strange to think about the fact that the last episode of this series was literally two years ago. Time is an illusion, and so is death. In any case, I won't promise that I'll get back to any kind of regular schedule this time, as every time I do, I end up disappearing for another two years. But what I will say is this. If you like this video, please let me know in the comments. I am a whore for attention and compliments, so if y'all like it, maybe I'll move mountains and make a new episode in a few months. This has been Pixelation, reminding each and every one of you to stay pixelated. I'll see you next time.